Welcome to Thursday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us here again today. And we're in week number one of our series we are just calling The Rest Area. A rest area talking about just as if sin never existed in our life. And that's really what justify means. God is viewing us and treating us, giving us promises and performing those promises in our life just as if sin never existed in our life. Now I know to a religious mindset, that's a tough pill to swallow right there. But this is the reality of the new covenant. This is the reality of the rest of God. It is a finished work of redemption. What does that mean, a finished work of redemption? That means it's a perfect work. That means it's a complete work. Well, what are we redeemed from? Sin and all of its evil effects. So listen, if sin were still a problem, if it still were an issue to us, then this wouldn't be a finished work. This wouldn't be a completed and perfect work. But because it's a finished, completed, perfect work, that means sin has been abolished, put away, done away with, and God is looking at us, treating us just as if sin never existed in our life. That is the good news of the gospel. But you know what? We have to mix our faith with that. We have to accept by faith the finished work of Jesus and get off the bandwagon of the dead works of religion and religious duties. I want to go back over to Romans chapter 4 once again. Romans 4 again is talking about what Abraham found out. What he learned that caused his faith to go out the roof and caused him to receive the fulfillment of God's perfect will, the promises of God in his life. Now, in the middle of Romans chapter 4, we hit a, a very important verse here in verse number 16. Romans 4, 16. I want to read that one more time. It says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, Abraham found out that if he would approach God and believe his word by faith, then God would treat him according to grace. Now, God's grace was already there, but Abraham were, was responding to the grace of God by his faith. And you know what? He found out that God put righteousness in his account. He justified him. He was looking at him, viewing him. He was promising, giving him promises, and then performing those promises in Abraham's life, just as if sin never existed in his life. Now, God w was already dealing with him according to grace. But Abraham had to learn and find out this way of grace. He had to find out that God was now promising him and treating him just as if, if sin never existed. In other words, his head and heart had to come up to speed with what God had already done by grace. And so this is what he's talking about from uh, in, in Romans chapter 4. How he received the fulfillment of the promise that God said, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, how did, how, why did God say that? What was the basis for God saying that to Abraham? Was it because of Abraham's good works? Did Abraham earn it or deserve it through his good performance? No, it was all because of grace. That's what this is all about right here. This is, what your, this is what's going to make your life completely different. Your approach to God, your relationship with God, your fellowship with God, your receiving from God, totally different when you view it as God treating you as if sin never existed. That's what Abraham found out. So God, God, uh, Abraham found the fulfillment of that promise by faith in this grace. But, you know, we read it yesterday, so it won't take time to read all of these scriptures again, going on down to verse number 20 here. But it, it all has to do with where Abraham's focus was on. See, if our focus is on ourself... That's where our faith is going to be. And really, that faith, if, if our focus is on us, our faith is actually going to turn into doubt and unbelief. That's what it's always going to do. But see, when our focus is, is get, it, it, when it gets off of us, and we focus the object of our faith on God, on His grace, on His finished work in Christ, that's where unbelief and doubt are eradicated. 
That's what they're done away with. And we have a strengthened faith, not a weakened faith. And that's what he says. In fact, let's go up to verse 19 and read that again. Verse 19 says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. He didn't consider himself. He didn't consider what he could do. He said, but he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. So notice Abraham got his eyes off of himself, his inability to do this, his inability to work and deserve and earn this kind of uh, good grace in his life, he got it over on the giver of that grace, over on God and what he could do. And notice he was strengthened in faith when he gave glory to God. In other words, giving glory to God means your focus is over on God. You're, you're, you're considering God. You're considering what God can do, not what you can do. That's going to cause your faith to be strengthened. Whereas if you're considering yourself, your ability to perform, your dead works of religion to earn and deserve these kind of things, you're always going to come to a place of weakened, a weakened faith, unbelief, and doubt. But notice he became strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, verse 21, and being fully persuaded, fully convinced. This is where his faith came. It came to that place of fully convinced, fully persuasion that what God had promised God was also able to perform. God's the promiser. God's the performer. We're the believer. We're the receiver. God doesn't give us promises and then say, all right, I want you to go fulfill those promises. No. Abraham tried that and created an Ishmael in his life. Abraham learned through all this. God promised it. Why would he promise it? Because of grace. Because of what God can do, not what Abraham could do. And that God performed that, and God and Abraham came to a place of fully persuaded, strong, fully convinced faith. And I tell you, that's why the promises of God were fulfilled in his life. It goes on in verse 22 and says, And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us also who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, verse 25, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised to secure our justification. Notice it wasn't just written for Abraham's sake. It was written for all of us. This was written for all of us so that we could learn and, and find out what Abraham found out so that we can also come to that fully persuaded, strong, strengthened faith in what God had promised he was also able to perform. Now, why does God perform these things in our life? It's not because we're so good. It's because he's so good. It's not because that we perform all these dead works of religion and finally earn this thing in our life. It's because of God's grace. It's all grace-based. So we have to come to the place of having a mindset that it's all grace and it's all him doing it and not us performing and earning it. Now, faith on our end will re require corresponding actions, but it's not corresponding, it's not actions to become, deserve, or earn. It's corresponding actions of faith based on what God had promised, on what He's giving to us, what He's already done and provided for us by grace in the finished work of Jesus. Now, again, verse 25, one of my favorite verses of Scripture here. Boy, it's so strong, but I'm going to read it in Amplify, verse 25. It says, Who was betrayed, Jesus was betrayed, and put to death because of our misdeeds, because of our sins. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And he says, And he was raised to secure our justification, our acquittal, making our account balance, and absolving us from all guilt before God. I want you to see that that Jesus was raised. Was he raised? Yes, he was. He was resurrected and raised to secure our justification. In other words, again, what does justification mean? What does justify mean? God is treating us just as if sin never existed. That's what righteousness is. Righteousness is the ability to approach God, to receive from Him, 
to, to fellowship with Him, take our heavenly seat next to Him that He's already reserved for us, just as if sin never existed without any sense of guilt, inferiority, condemnation, or shame, just like sin never existed. Now, why is that? Because Jesus secured that in His resurrected. Jesus secured that justification for us. He secured our righteousness. He secured the, the reality that God treats us just as if sin never existed in our life. He cleared our accounts out. Now see, in order to accept this reality right here, you have to believe that God's grace is more than enough. You have to believe and put your trust in the grace of God. That God's grace is sufficient. It was sufficient to take care of the sin problem. It was sufficient to justify us. It is sufficient to create and, and provide for us by grace everything that we need in every time of need. We have to believe in that right there. That means our focus has to be on God. It has to be in the grace of God. That's why it goes on in chapter 5 of Romans chapter 5. And we'll just go on down to verse number 15. Uh, Romans 5, 15. We have to develop this, this revelation, this understanding of the grace of God, that it is all sufficient. It is more than enough. And it is something we can base our faith on. It's grace and faith here. All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 15. In the Amplified, I have to go to the Amplified on this, as we have in previous messages and, and series. It says, but God's free gift, notice it's a free gift, is not at all to be compared to the trespass. That's, that's where we messed up. That's sin and the fall of man. It, it, it's incomparable. What God did in His grace in Christ in the finished work is incomparable to sin in the fall of man. That didn't belittle sin in the fall of man. It, it sent Jesus to the cross. It put Him through the crucifixion. But listen, the grace of God in Christ was more than enough. It says, the, the free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. Now, look at that. Incomparable, disproportional grace that God issued in Christ. What does that mean right there? That means that, that Jesus was an overpayment for our sin. That means that God gave more grace than was necessary to deal with sin, to obliterate it, to abolish it, to pay the sin debt off and do away with it in our life. This is why we can have the mindset that God is treating us now that, that it, just as if sin never existed. It says, For if, if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, much more profusely, much more profusely, did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. So again, that, he's just reiterating that, that big exclamation point right here. This is, the, this is the basis for the gospel. This is the basis for Paul's revelation. This is the basis for us being able to approach God and receive from Him in boldness and confidence just as if sin never existed. It's because God gave us disproportional incomparable grace, this abounding, abundant, abounding, and overflowing to and for the benefit of many. That's why we can come to the throne of grace to, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Verse 17 goes on to say, For if because of one man's trespass, his lapse of offense, death reigned through that one, much more, much more surely will those who receive receive, accept this reality, receive God's overflowing grace. There it is, overflowing, more than enough. His overflowing grace, His unmerited favor, and the free gift of the righteousness, His free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with Himself, reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. I want you to see again that what we're putting our faith in and receiving is abundant, overflowing grace. Grace that's more than enough. Grace, grace that more than took care of the sin problem, the sin issue. This is why I can boldly say that God is now looking at us and we can approach Him and receive from Him just as if sin never existed. 
See, a lot of religious-minded people don't know all this. They would say, well, who do you think you are? In other words, what they're saying is, what do you think you've done to deserve or earn it? Nothing. This is not earning and deserving. This is not works-based at all. It's all grace-based. What God did for us in Christ in His finished work is grace-based. More than enough. We need to get our eyes off of us, our ability to perform and earn, we need to get our eyes even off of sin. Jesus did away with that and abolished it. And we need to put a, the focus of our faith squarely on God, on His grace, His ability to perform what He promised. And because of grace, God is giving to us just as if sin never existed in our life. Boy, that's powerful right there. If we can just get a hold of that right there, and allow that to change our mentality, change our mindset, our perspective, our attitudes, even what we believe. And I can tell you, we're going to be like Abraham real quick. We're going to become fully persuaded that what God had promised, he's also able to perform. Well, that's all the time I've got for today. Join us again tomorrow as we wrap up this week number one. If you'd like additional materials, go to TonyCowan.org and we will see you tomorrow.